Kuz example, welcome to Bhutan This Week with me, Sonam Pem. Our top stories this week. His Royal Highness Prince Jigil Ugen Wanchuk inaugurates a Trans Bhutan Trail. BOB admits system failure and accepts over 6 million Newton fine. And parents and caregivers of students at Wangsal Institute for the Deaf plead community to learn sign language. His Royal Highness Prince Jigil Ugen Wanchuk, a representative of His Majesty the King and the President of Bhutan Olympic Committee, has formally inaugurated the Trans Bhutan Trail. The inauguration ceremony was held at the historic Simtokazong on Wednesday. The trail spans 403 kilometers across the country through nine districts, 27 geoks, and two national parks. As part of the launch, the Prime Minister led a hike from Semtaka Zong to Punaka, covering over 35 kilometers of the Trans Bhutan Trail section. The restoration of the Trans Bhutan Trail was conceived by His Majesty the King to revive and promote Bhutan's ancient trail known as the Shunglam. The restoration was supported by the Bhutan Canada Foundation and its founder in partnership with the Tourism Council of Bhutan. We wanted to restore a cultural asset here in Bhutan and to get the young people in the country out onto the trail. We also wanted to promote development, economic development in the rural areas and, and bring in international tourists as well to help support that. Over 900 individuals, including day soups, scouts, tourism sector, professionals, members from the village communities, and various government, institutions, and corporate agencies contributed to the effort. The trail is considered an important symbol of national unity and a living cultural heritage. Most importantly, our monarchs have also traveled this trail where they met people and united them. So in a way, the transport and trail is a, a trail of national unity. Uh, it is symbolically important that the trail, transport and trail has actually uh, helped to develop Bhutan as a nation state. Besides, the Trans-Bhutan Trail is expected to contribute to the tourism sector. Recently, the trail was listed in Time magazine's World's Greatest Places to Visit in 2022, highlighting unique travel destinations to visit across the globe. It has also won awards for sustainability and community engagement. I think a lot of people from my home country, from Germany, would love this trail um, because it's very diverse and you learn a lot about the culture here and you, because of the beautiful scenery and the friendly people, the great food. I think it's just a combination of everything. According to officials, the trail was revived to enhance the economic livelihood of communities starting from Ha through Tashigang. It can be uh, beneficial to the communities and also for our youth in Bhutan. Uh, they can walk the trail, experience nature. It's more of an experiential learning for the youth of Bhutan. La. A group of 24 young scouts are also hiking the entire length of the trail, a feat that will take them 35 days. The scout walk will incorporate nature-based education experiences, develop leadership and teamwork skills, support local communities through voluntary activities and contribute to nation building. Uh, we don't often get, the, get this type of opportunity to walk through the forest and enjoy the environment because we have our road. Many of, like, people, many of the people love traveling through uh, vehicles because they don't want to get tired by just walking. And it also, like, uh, through my experience uh, till, till date, uh, like, <clears throat> I feel very peace la, walking through the forest and listening to the bird chirping and all. This group of scouts, who have already covered about 200 kilometers, will reach Tashigang by the mid of next month. 
they will continue their journey tomorrow from Chendipji to Tsangka in Trungsa. The Trans-Bhutan Trail also launched its membership program, which contributes directly to the sustainability of the trail and also gives an opportunity for all citizens to take ownership of this ancestral trail. For Karmawandi, this is Pemal Hardin, BBS News. Her Royal Highness Princess Sonam Deshin Wanchuk attended the state funeral of late former Prime Minister of Japan Shinzo Abe in Tokyo, Japan on Tuesday. Her Royal Highness is attending the state funeral as the representative of His Majesty the King. During the state funeral, Her Royal Highness took part in the memorial service, offered prayers and respects and placed a white chrysanthemum flower at the memorial altar of the late Prime Minister as per the Japanese tradition. Her Royal Highness also met Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida and Mrs. Ake Abe, wife of the late former Prime Minister of Japan. During the meeting, Her Royal Highness conveyed the deep condolences of His Majesty the King, the people and the Royal Government of Bhutan on the tragic passing of the former Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, who was a good friend of Bhutan. The state funeral for the former Prime Minister of Japan was held in Nippon Budokan Arena in Tokyo. It was attended by the Imperial Family of Japan, representatives of the people and the government of Japan, state representatives from around the world, and the family of the late Prime Minister of Japan. With the reopening of the country's borders, 30 tourists have arrived paying the revised sustainable development fee of 200 US dollars. They were among 90 tourists who entered the country through the Paro International Airport last Friday. The rest are on the old SDF of 65 US dollars. Soon after the landing of the day's first flight, the passengers were given a glimpse of Bhutanese hospitality. Welcome to Bhutan. Welcome to Bhutan. A grand reception by the Tourism Council of Bhutan, followed by the distribution of souvenirs and refreshments. There were four flights to Paro today. All the passengers were given grand receptions. The incoming travelers will no longer have to follow the strict procedures implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic. Only about one-third of the tourists who arrived today was on the revised STF. Many had planned their travel to Bhutan before the pandemic. We closed our border gates to tourists in 2020. But the government said that we should allow them to come on the old STF, as they have already planned and even made payments. So, there are about 14,000 tourists on the old STF. However, this group of tourists will have to visit Bhutan by the end of next year. Speaking to BBS, a few foreigners said the revised sustainable development fee did not stop the dream of visiting Bhutan. So, I, I actually feel okay with it, but I, I feel like I'm blessed um, because I can afford it. So, uh, that, that was my only thought is for, for me it doesn't I, I was okay with it so but it, it does seem like um, it can limit the amount of people that can travel to Bhutan but I think that that's part of the charm of it right to limit the amount of tourists that are coming and have it be less congested so I, I think it's okay we wanted to visit Bhutan I think it's been like more than five hour, five years than I, when I was planning uh, coming here and then pandemic came, so all our plans were postponed. Until now, we uh, were in touch in uh, one of the agencies here. It is too soon to see how the new tourism policy will take forward the industry. But there is reassurance that the revised SDF will not hold back people who really want to visit the country. For Nam and Paro, Kiladim, BBS News. Tourists visiting Bhutan driving their own vehicles will have to pay a fee of 4,500 newton per vehicle per night. This also includes two wheelers. This is as per the revised Tourism Rules and Regulations 2022, which came into effect on Friday. Visitors driving their own vehicles will have to pay 4,500 newton in addition to the sustainable development fee. 
the Road Safety and Transport Authority will be collecting the fee. Before the pandemic, some visitors from India, Nepal and Bangladesh used to enter and visit sites in Bhutan driving their own vehicles. Although the numbers were minimal, tourists from Europe and America also toured the country driving their own vehicles. The visiting vehicles were then levied a road permit fee of 100 meters per day as per the road safety and transport regulations. This green fee of 4,500 is inclusive of all other fees. I mean, they don't have to pay any other fees like road permit and all. Based on our experiences uh, in the past, since tourists do come with their own cars, we had to deal with this tourism. And similarly, there were also other categories of uh, tourists coming uh, with a very high-end uh, vehicle also. So therefore, in this uh, new tourism rules and regulations of 2022, this provision has been uh, included, uh, mainly to fa facilitate. La. A visitor driving a foreign tourist vehicle should adhere to all relevant rules and regulations like the carrying capacity and roadworthiness of the vehicle adopted by the Road Safety and Transport Authority. And their entry will be restricted if the vehicle doesn't meet these criteria even after paying the fee. However, visitors won't have to pay the fee if they do not drive their vehicles beyond the first designated point. For car also, if it is within that uh, first interior uh, designated check post, uh, if they drive around with their own car, that fee is still not applicable uh, for. And also, uh, they enter our border town, let's say for example in Finseling, and then they move around in their own car. And next day if they were pl are planning to go to Thimphu, they can still leave their car parked in Finseling, wherever they are, uh, I mean, the, the accommodation or wherever is the designated parking place, they can park there, but there will be no fees, fees charged. According to the TCB, the levy of the fee on tourists driving their own vehicles is to minimize the negative impact of vehicle emission on the country's pristine environment and control traffic. Samton Dolker, BBS News. Long queues at the pedestrian terminal in Finsling continue to frustrate the general public. With an increasing number of visitors coming in and going out every day, the pedestrian terminal is overburdened with an overwhelming number of people. It takes a minimum of 30 minutes or more to cross the Finseling and Jaigang gateways. One will need a great amount of patience if one wants to visit Jaigang today. Day 3 into the border gate reopening and the line outside the pedestrian terminal seems to be growing longer and longer. Most public here is frustrated as they have to wait in long queues for hours. The scorching sun and a substantial amount of time to wait in an endless queue, you will have to bear it all. Unlike in the past, one might now have to spend at least half a day visiting and returning from Jaigong. It has been around one and a half hours that I am waiting here in line. The new system is good, but it is becoming very challenging for the general public. We have to wait in long queues every day to visit Jaigong. It takes a minimum of 30 minutes to one hour to cross the terminal and visit Jaigong. For a young person like me, it is not much of a problem. But for women who are pregnant, elders and people with disabilities, it is very challenging to wait in long queues. In the past, we do not have to show our ID cards and were allowed to enter and exit the gate easily. Now things are different with new rules. I'm going to visit Jai Gong for the first after nearly three years. I just hope it won't take me a very long time. I tried to visit Jai Gong yesterday by showing the photo of the ID card that I took on my phone. But the officials here restricted my movement, saying that they need the document in hard copy. I had to go back to my home, bring the original ID card and again wait in the long line. This in total took me nearly three hours. Despite registering with the pre-registration online system of the immigration office, one will have to produce an identity card as a supporting document that too in the original copy. The officials do not accept any other documents. The Indian officials at the gate, however, accept a passport, voter card and other documents as supporting documents to enter Jaigong.
and for botanists who have lost their identity card or have not renewed their ID cards, looks like they will have to wait a little longer to enter Jaigong. For now, both botanists and Indian officials are not accepting expired documents. As per sources, a few botanists were not allowed to enter Jaigong yesterday as their ID cards had expired. Talking to the people waiting outside the pedestrian terminal, they suggested the immigration office introduce more exit routes and deploy more immigration officials at the terminal. With winter approaching, the number of people visiting Finsoling is only expected to increase. BBS contacted the immigration officials for comments. Since day one of the border gate reopening on Friday, a minimum of 15 to 16,000 people have passed through the pedestrian terminal. This is Pasang Doji for BVS News, Finsoling. Admitting there was a system failure, the Bank of Bhutan says it accepts the penalty handed down by the central bank. The Royal Monetary Authority slapped a fine of more than 6 million newtum against the bank after BOB's system shut down completely for almost three days earlier this month. The bank has submitted a justification for the failure and is awaiting the final response from the central bank regarding the penalty. On the 6th of September, the Bank of Bhutan failed to provide both online and offline services. The problem continued the next day. Following this, the central bank issued a notice to the BOB imposing the penalty. As per the notice, the bank was penalized on the grounds of not doing timely corrective action and continuing the violation, repetition of similar violations, and impact on financial stability, among others. Apologizing to the clients, the bank admitted there was a failure and says it is accountable for the system errors. I would like to take this opportunity to apologize to all our valid clients for two days of service failure. On the penalty, in fact, I have no comments because uh, they have penalized the bank based on the, the penalty rules and regulations that they have uh, adopted a long time back and revised in 2022, uh, July. Looking at the severity of the impact, I think uh, we are li liable to, to, to be penalized. BOB was asked to submit explanations to the central bank within a 14-day notice period, which ended on 21st September. The BOB has submitted the report to the RMA. Our request was uh, because this was so one-off incident uh, and uh, not intentional because systems, uh, we never know what is going to happen, despite putting in so many measures in place. So based on that, we have submitted our justification. But... Uh, we never know uh, how the, the, the regulator would accept our explanation. So we need to wait and then see what happens. And penalty amount may not change because they have done this based on their policy. The central bank imposed the penalty based on its penalty rules and regulations 2022. Samtan Dolker, BBS News. Bhutanese households across the country will soon be able to start orchid farming and enhance livelihoods. The Agriculture Ministry will start providing orchid seedlings from an orchid micropropagation laboratory at Serbithang in Thimpu. The lab was inaugurated recently. The newly inaugurated Orchid Micropropagation Laboratory will be able to produce thousands of seedlings from a single orchid seapod without having to collect thousands of plants from the wild. According to a news release from the Agriculture Ministry, the orchid seedlings produced will then be distributed to the communities interested to pursue orchid farming. The seedlings will also be displayed and conserved at the Royal Botanical Garden for educational and awareness purposes. According to the ministry, some native orchids are threatened with over-harvesting and exploitation since they are considered a delicacy in Bhutanese cuisine. Meanwhile, a mushroom spawn laboratory at the National Mushroom Centre was also inaugurated today. Besides producing and supplying mushroom seeds, the lab will conduct research on mushrooms. Both the laboratories were established with support from the European Union. The EU has supported the renewable natural resource sector in Bhutan since 1984. 
As per the ministry, over the last four decades, the support has evolved from a modest water supply project to the current budget support program, which aims to strengthen the food system resilience in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. News. From using firewood to liquefied petroleum gas or LPG to electric cooking stove, Bhutan has come a long way in terms of clean energy consumption. Although some rural households still use firewood, many have switched to better and healthier cooking options over the years. An increasing number of households are now using electric cooking stove, helping the country achieve its clean and aff affordable energy goal. One of the electric stove users is 73-year-old Kenju Dem from Ha, who lives in Thimpo. She started using the infrared cooking stove since last year. According to her, using an electric stove is not only convenient, but also safer for her health. She added in the past her son used to change LPG cylinders frequently every month, which is quite expensive. Yes, Electric cooking stove is very healthful and also convenient for me. We don't use gas much now. Once we change LPG cylinder, it lasts for almost a year now. Since I'm in the kitchen most of the time, I use it every day. Using LPG is quite dangerous as we might burn ourselves, but for the electric stove, we just have to switch on and turn off the electricity. Drug Garden Home Appliances, one of the country's main dealers, started the idea of supplying electric stove in the country in 2018. The company distributed more than 30,000 infrared stoves across the country over the last five years. Initially, due to lack of awareness, they could sell only about 30,000 stoves in a year. However, the numbers have increased to about 8,000 in a year now. Now I think the users have increased since they are aware of the advantages. It can be a substitute for LPG gas. It is cost-saving and it is a one-time investment as the electricity consumption is very less. According to the Department of Renewable Energy, using an electric stove emits almost zero carbon compared to firewood and LPG. Moreover, it is a sustainable option for the long run. The LPG is a fossil fuel. Um, while it can be considered as a cleaner option compared to using fuel wood or uh, even coal, it is still a fossil fuel and has uh, associated emission, carbon emission. And because it is fossil fuel, it has limited supply. And if our use of LPG keeps increasing, eventually the source will run out. So. That's why uh, we feel that uh, switching to electric cook stove is a better option. The department initiates various advocacy programs across the country to reduce their reliance on fossil fuels. As per the Bhutan Trade Statistics 2021, the country imported about 9 million LPG cylinders worth more than 450 million newton, mostly from India last year. Observing the International Week for the Deaf, parents and caregivers of students studying at the Wangsal Institute for the Deaf in Poro pleaded with the community to learn sign language. They said, for the deaf community, sign language is not simply a means of communication, but it is a part of belonging to a community. <laughs> Parents and caregivers of more than 100 deaf students of the institute took part in the week-long observation last week. Amongst them was a 60-year-old Sering from Chanangka in Paro. She has rented a house near the institute to take care of her 11-year-old grandson who is a student of the institute. When deaf children try to communicate with sign language, we laugh and do not respond properly. But we must not do that. We must learn the language. If we do so, then this will solve most of the problems. They can also understand what we are trying to say. When we were small, there were people who cannot talk or hear. They are mostly sent as herders or are mostly ignored by the community. 
But as I came here and saw how the children are being engaged, I was taken aback. They are doing much better than most of us. I am proud of the teachers and the students here. Since they cannot hear, the hands become their ears and mouth. But the sign languages we use at home are different from the ones the children learn in school. So we all must take part in learning sign languages. Sign language allows children who are deaf to enjoy learning and socializing. People around can also learn sign language, whereby including deaf people within and making us as one community. Similarly, like uh, if we are to speak Dzongka and uh, if uh, somebody doesn't know how to speak Dzongka, there will be a communication gap. So these things happen with the students who are deaf. Their language is sign language. We were excited to perform in front of our parents and other spectators. We also had a chance to socialize with them and share our experiences. They understood how important our language is for inclusivity. I'm happy. To equip parents and caregivers with their skills, the institute started a special class for parents to learn sign language beginning this year. And according to the institute, on average, 15 parents and caregivers come to attend the class every Friday. For Namge Wanchin Paro, Sunam Pem for BBS News. That's all we have for you this week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.